Good morning, church. Jesus is alive. Let's give him a shout of praise. Come on. The greatest day in history. Death is beaten. You have rescued me. Sing it out. Jesus is alive. Amen. Cross the empty grave, life eternal. You have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. And oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same
What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings. Thank you, Jesus, that on the cross you died so that we may receive life, receive forgiveness. And so, Lord, we want to celebrate your goodness even this morning on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. What a proclamation that Jesus is alive. And so we come together as God's people, Lord, to affirm that to one another because we have experienced Christ in our life for those who love Jesus. We experience not only His love, but His leading and His teaching, His 
instructing how we ought to live life. And for that, we thank you. And so, Holy Spirit, will you come and manifest powerfully the presence of Christ right here in our midst, Lord, so that we can truly experience you for who you are. So come, Lord Jesus, and all God's children say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Please be seated. And I invite the pastors and elders to join me up here. And even as we come to this Holy Communion, what an amazing communion, especially on Easter and on the Easter Sunday. And I'm reminded of this passage of Scripture, and I pray and hope that we all have meditated upon you know, the life of Jesus and what He did on the cross and how He will come one day. Now here in this passage here from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which I am actually going to preach on later on, but I thought I would just mention this. For He said, what, For what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance. In other words, this is the most important Everything else is a shadow. This is of first importance. So listen to this carefully. That's what Apostle Paul is saying. So what is of first importance? That Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. Why is it so important that he died? Because he experienced death for all of us. So we don't have to die that spiritual death. And then he said that he was buried and he was buried in the same way we were buried in our baptism to say that the old is gone, the new has come. The old person is gone, no more. And in that burial, we are dead. We die to ourselves. And then he goes on to say that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. So this is our first importance that he died for our sins, he was buried, and he was raised on the third day. And that's what we are proclaiming uh, this morning in this Holy Communion, that he died, and that he was buried, and that he is risen. What a proclamation, because this is the central truth of the Christian faith. And so I want to invite all of us who are Christians to partake of this. If you're not a Christian, it's okay. You can observe. And you too can pray to the Lord Jesus yourself and ask Him to reveal Himself to you. And so Christ our Lord invites to His table all who love Him and who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, you form us in your image and breathe into us the breath of life. And when we turn away, our love failed. Your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And when the Lord ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And so, in remembrance of this, your mighty acts, as we partake of this communion, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. And let's proclaim this aloud together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. Let's lift our hands to the Lord to receive a blessing. And pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine. And make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ come in final victory. And we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, our honour and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 
So you make sure you have a communion element with you. And those of you who may not have taken one as you come in, just raise your hands where you are and Asha will come to you, just in case there's some hands over there. Can you, Asha, just look out for the hands that are raised up? We'll wait until you get your whole communion element. Just raise your hands. Just keep raising your hands until someone comes to you. Church, I pray even as we partake of this communion element, let's be reminded, be reminded of the goodness of God in our lives. I'm going to pray the prayer of repentance together. And in this prayer of repentance, we're reminded to make right with the Lord. I know the week or the weeks have passed. Some of us feel that we are not maybe in the right posture of hearts to be here. But tell you what, we are reminded as we went through, even right now going through the series on the book of Romans, we are reminded that we will never be good enough. No matter what we do, we will never be good enough. And they are reminded in the Romans, book of Romans is that we cannot save ourselves except what Jesus has done on the cross for us. And that is why we can come in repentance before God and God will forgive us. So all of us, let's make right with God. If whatever that you have done in your life, there's no condemnation to those who love Jesus. Amen? So let's pray this prayer of repentance together, slowly, together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. Let's pause there. Let's continue. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, Amen. Let's hold the bread in our hand. So let's hold the bread. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. And this bread is the bread of life. Jesus said, whoever eats of me will never go hungry. So we need to feed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of this bread together. And let's hold a cup in our hand. And Jesus said, I am the life. And whoever drinks of me will never go thirsty. And we're reminded that the Holy Spirit lives in each of us, the Spirit of Christ. And we partake of this wine. We are reminded that He is in us. So drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of this together. Holy Spirit, thank you for even this act of worship. That right now we are, Lord, in the presence of the living God. Only Jesus has made that way possible for us. 
because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that is why we are here this morning, celebrating in the presence of God what you have done for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that on this Easter Sunday, we celebrate your resurrection. So will you reveal yourself to us, God, to everyone here, young and old, God, men or women. Father, we want to sense and encounter your presence in a powerful way even this morning. And we pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue on in our worship. From heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our Savior died.
Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, we declare this day that you are alive. And because you are alive, Lord, we have hope in this world. Hallelujah. 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 So, Lord, we come before you this morning, just as we are, to celebrate and praise your holy name. And as we come, Lord, continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can experience Christ in a fantastic and marvelous way, even this morning. So, Lord, come. Come and fill our hearts with just more of Jesus so that you will increase and we will decrease. So to you, Lord, be all glory, all honor, because your name is majestic. In the name of Jesus we declare, and all God's people say, Amen, Amen. Let's give God a loud clap of it. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. For you are worthy. You are worthy of all praise, because Jesus is alive this day, and we praise your name. Hallelujah. Just before you're seated, today is a special day, because once in a year we can do what we call the Paschal greeting, as to greet each other with this greeting. So one of you will say to the other person, Christ is alive, and Christ is risen, sorry, Christ is risen, and the other person will say, He is risen indeed. So one person say, Christ is risen, the other person say, He is risen indeed. Let's do it to, with one another. Christ is risen, He is risen indeed. Let's greet one another with this Paschal greeting. Hallelujah, this is true. Christ is risen, and He is risen indeed amen welcome welcome to all of you if you are here in pj welcome to dream center Pataling jaya good to see so many of you here similarly if you are in puchong greetings of the same good to see all of you in dmc at puchong as well it's so great to see you gather in god's name and online if you're tuning in via youtube greetings and shalom to you and to greet you in the name of Jesus and welcome for joining us on this special Resurrection Sunday service as we gather together in Jesus' name. So many of us actually have journeyed from Friday, Good Friday service, Holy Saturday service, and today is Resurrection Sunday service. And Sunday is a celebration because Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. I can hear the amen all the way from Puchung and online as well. Fantastic. Yeah, good to see see all of you having the spirit of Christ even on Resurrection Sunday. And because we didn't have a chance to welcome some of you on Friday and on Saturday and today as well, if you're here for the first time especially, either you're visiting us or you came because of an invitation of a friend or because in God's will, you are here because you wanted to celebrate Easter with us. I'm going to invite all of you to stand or to wave your hand in a moment. And if you're online, also click on the link, the QR code that you see as well and also let us know that you are here and we want to connect with you. But those who are in person, whether in PJ or in Puchong, at the count of three, I just want you to stand and we want to greet you in the name of Jesus and also wish you a blessed Resurrection Sunday. Okay? Are you ready? At the count of three. One, two, three. I invite you to stand if you are here this morning, if you are new. So I want to welcome you. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, this morning. Standing, I can see you waving as well in Puchong online. Thank you for clicking on the link and also clicking on the QR code. I want to welcome you. Great to see all of you. Some of you are at the gallery as well. Sorry if I miss you, but if you are new, please just wave your hand so that we know that you are here. And if you are here in person, whether in PJ or in Puchong, we want to welcome you to our welcome space. And the welcome space, the location are displayed on the screen. You can join us for a cup of coffee and tea. Or if you want to just connect with us. Some of you have been visiting our celebration for many weekends, but have not connected with someone in church. We want to encourage you to just come to the welcome space so that we can connect with you and we want to form friendships with you as well. Hallelujah. So good to see you once again, especially if you're here on Easter Sunday. So many of you have gathered because you wanted to hear the Word of God and celebrate His resurrection. So even as we enter a time of giving, you're going to see the giving details on the screen as well. So kindly click on the QR code if you want to give digitally or if you'd like to give physically, we have boxes, physical boxes that you can drop your offering on the way out of, after the celebration is over. But before we give, even this morning, I just want you to just Reflect for a moment. 
reflect on the journey that we have gone through for the last three days. On Good Friday, we went through the journey where we saw Jesus going to the cross, dying for our sins. And our sins hung Him there. And on Holy Saturday, we witnessed His body being taken down from the cross and buried in the tomb. And the tomb was sealed. But today, on Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate the goodness of God, that He is risen and that Jesus is alive. And for this, all of us have a living hope for all that Christ has done. Christ has died. Christ has risen. And Christ will come back again. And so, Lord, even as we come this morning, with our tithes and offerings ready to give to you, Lord, we come to you with thanksgiving in our hearts. Nothing that we can ever do, no amount that we can give, can fully reflect your love for us. And our response to you is simply, we worship you, Lord, just as we are. We give unto you all that we are because of who you are to us. So this morning, Lord, we ask you to bless tithes and offerings, that even as we give to you and the work of your kingdom, may many people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hope of our risen Saviour, that many will come to know you, even as we have known you, so that we will share the joy of salvation that we possess in you. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving yourself so that I may live. And so today, even as I give, I give to you with a thankful and grateful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you for giving. And even as we progress on, let us tune our eyes and ears to hear and see what is on UMC News this weekend. Let's watch the screen. Workers are essential, their labor crucial, but prayer precedes all else. Join us as we intercede for our mission partners and the unreached people groups around the world.
Good morning. Good morning. And blessed Easter. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Can we do that? It's amazing to be here. And I pray that you will be blessed. I want to welcome especially those who are here for the first time. And we have a group of friends from Sydney, all the way from Sydney. We'd like to welcome you here. All right. And, and I believe that many, you know, hands that were up earlier on as well, would like to welcome you here. And those at DMC at Puchong, uh, we have three persons there, Hui Hui, El Eliver, and Lee Rong. So I'd like to welcome you here at our Puchong Multi site. And those of us who have no chance to shake your hands, you know, I pray that one day I'll meet you. And uh, if you don't have a home church, please send our regards. And if you don't have a home church, please, you know, uh, come and join us, all right? And uh, be a part of this wonderful family called UMC, and we'll be more than happy to introduce you uh, to this church. And if you do come from another church, please send our greetings to your, your pastor and elder and leaders of the church to say that UMC uh, says hello. Right at this time in our Easter service, uh, we have other congregations going, uh, celebration going on at the same time. We have a Chinese celebration going on right now, right? And we have our Bahasa and Tamil later on at about 10 o'clock. And then our Myanmar will be happening this afternoon and Nepali happened last night. So when you walk out this door, for those who are here for the first time, you hear different languages going out there in the lobby, all right? This is the church you know, that one day we will experience that many nations will come together. There will be hundreds of nations, hundreds of languages that we don't recognize, but we understand, all right, when one day on a new earth. So what an amazing celebration, one day. And that is why Resurrection Sunday is so very uh, important. And I want you at this, this morning here to just once in a while glance at that cross over there. Once in a while look at that cross as and I preach uh, from the Word of God. And be reminded that Jesus is no longer hanging on that cross. He's no longer there. Right? And He is resurrected today. Now, last night, and I hope all of you here who, who did not come last night, you know, it was a special uh, service that we did, Holy Saturday. And I preached a sermon, an entirely different sermon. I hope you will, if you're not here last night, uh, go onto YouTube this afternoon. You will be able uh, to view that video I talk about, you know, re really last night I preached to the congregation, it was a funeral sermon. And some of them were shocked, right, when I started the whole sermon. It is a funeral sermon, preparing you for what's to come, right? Because all of us face death. And at the sermon, last night's sermon, I was just challenging everyone. Do you know where you're going when you die? Because all of us have only one shot in life. Meaning that while on this earth, we have to make a decision because when you finally die, there's no second chance. So everything that, every decision that you have to make is while on this earth while you are alive. And what the decision that you make on this earth while you're alive determines what's going to happen after that. And so in that sermon last night, you know, I shared what will happen when you die. And that is why I said it is a funeral sermon. But it gives so much, it gives us so much hope and so this morning, I want to talk about the resurrection of Christ. Just look at the cross once in a while. Remind yourself that Jesus is no longer on the cross. So Christ has died. Christ is risen. But the most important fact is that Christ will come again. What an amazing truth that we are reminded of today. Now, we want to read the Bible together as is the custom of the church here. We want to stand reading the Word of God. Not only do we stand, we lift up our Bible and to say that this is the Word of God. All right, why don't we stand and we're going to read the Word of God together from uh, the NIV version right on the screen, but we want to declare that this is my Bible. Are you ready? DMC, you know what to do, right? Okay, one, two, go. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It informs my mind, inspires my heart, and instructs my behavior. So help me, God. We're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. The same passage I preached on last night, but at a different angle altogether. So let's declare. Let's declare. Read aloud the Word of God together. Ready? One, two, go. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. 
By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Though some has fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So Holy Spirit, will you come and tutor us, God, with your word, that we may not only be informed in our minds, God, and inspire in our heart. But more than that, Father, it will change, transform the way we live our life. So Holy Spirit, come, teach us, Lord. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We declare Christ is risen, and your reply is? One more time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. What an amazing proclamation. Now, let me just in a nutshell, in a nutshell, we celebrate the different f Christian festivals. We celebrate the incarnation of Christ. The incarnation of Christ is celebrated on Christmas Day. God incarnated himself to be a man. And that man is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the incarnation of Christ that will prepare the world 33 years later for the crucifixion, which we celebrate on Good Friday. And then he was buried. Buried for how long? Three days and three nights. And in that burial, we celebrate it with Holy Saturday. And then we celebrate Good Friday this morning. And it is Resurrection Sunday. But it doesn't stop there. We don't just celebrate the resurrection of Christ and then stop. Because 40 days after resurrection was the ascension of Jesus to heaven. And so in some sense, Jesus waved goodbye. I need to go. I need to go to the Father. So he went up to heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. And I'll tell you later, what is he doing sitting at the right hand of God? So the ascension allowed him now to go to heaven. And then 50 days, 10 days after the ascension, 50 days from resurrection, all right, he then sent his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, he sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And that is why we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. All right, to remind ourselves that Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to live with us. So that's 50 days after resurrection. Now, that we are now living in that season. In the season where the Holy Spirit is here, we call this the new season of the new covenant. But you know what? There's something even more exciting coming on. Not 40 days after, not 50 days after resurrection. It is an indefinite time. We're not sure exactly when yet. But Jesus said, I am coming soon. And every century we have been declaring that. There's an urgency in us that Jesus will come again. Do you know when Jesus will come again? Anyone know? If any hand is up, I want to talk to you. How do you know, okay? How do you know that Jesus is coming? Because none of us know except who? Even Jesus himself doesn't know. It's the Father who knows. The Father is the one who, now, who then, in the coming days, say to Jesus, now is time, and he will come. And that is the day, will be an amazing day. An amazing day. So much will happen, and I preach about that as well in our series on Revelation, you know, last year. And it's an amazing, amazing truth of Scripture. Now, let's now come back to Easter as I give you an overview of what's going on, you know, in uh, the church. So why do we make such a fuss about Easter? Now, look at the cross again. It's an empty cross, right? Jesus is not hanging there. So why are we making a big deal about Easter? Not only about Easter, we make a big deal about His death, Good Friday. We make a big deal about His burial and then His resurrection, so let me go back to verse 3, the, one, uh, the passage we read earlier on just now. For it says then, and I mentioned this at the Holy Communion as well, what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance. 
first importance means that this is the most important, guys. The most important. So what is so important? That Christ died for our sins. Everyone say, Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture. That He was buried. Everyone say, that He was buried. And then it goes on to say that He was raised on the third day. Everyone say, He was raised on the third day. This is the most important, Apostle Paul is saying. Now, if this is the most important, let's better take note of this especially during Easter. Now, you know what? Not everyone, and let me say some Christians as well, not everyone believe in the bodily resurrection. They say, yeah, maybe, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, maybe it's a myth. You know, but his reason, yeah, some will say, well, conceptually his reason, his reason in my heart. His reason because, you know, it, 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 he, his teachings, you know, is everywhere. The Bible is everywhere. People are reading it. Yeah, he's alive, you know. And uh, he's alive because his teaching goes on in my heart. But not everyone is convinced that Jesus is actually alive today. He's a real person who's alive today in heaven. Now, that is what the Apostle Paul is trying to say. Of first importance, Christians don't even doubt that. It is not just a concept. It is not just a creed. And let me tell you why. Apostle Paul is so much into this, he said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13 to 14. He said, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. Wow. I can imagine now my preaching is useless. Huh? No point preaching, I'm out of here, man. If Christ is not resurrected... Not only, you know, our preaching is useless, so is your faith is useless. Wow. So you cannot say, yeah, maybe. You cannot talk like that. You cannot say it's a concept. Jesus is alive in my heart. I don't think he's physically alive right now. So it's important for us to understand this. If that is the case, then our sins are not forgiven and there's no hope for a better future. So that's important. Last night, I challenged everyone to think about this, and I say, have you thought about life after death? Do you know where you are heading? Because the resurrection of Christ confirms to you where you are heading. So do you know where you are heading when you die? That's a legitimate question, right? Dying is a 100% thing, you know? 100%, everyone will die. So whether we like to talk about death, especially for us Chinese, don't want to talk about death. Right? Choy, 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 the touch wood, they say. Don't talk about death. We avoid it. But the fact remains that all of us will die, and some of us will die young. Some will die older. But the fact of life, the curse of sin, is death. We will die. So my question to all of us here is, do you know what happened to you when you die? If you are sure, I celebrate you. You are so sure. But what if you're not sure? You know, some people who are not sure at all say things like this. Hell, uh. I know, I know, I know the Bible talks about if I don't know Jesus, I go to hell. Uh. Hell, uh. hell, my friends are all there. Uh. So I might as well, I join them. Uh. All right, I play golf with them for eternity. Let me tell you, if you know the Bible, how Jesus himself... Jesus himself talked more about hell than any other people. Well, so when Jesus talks about hell, the clues that we have about hell is this. It is not only about gnashing of teeth and, and, and punishment. It's the loneliest place in the entire universe. You are separated from God. God is no... At least here on earth, God is still here. You may not believe Him, but God is still here. He's watching over you. By hell one day, God is totally not there. Can you imagine the place God is not there? That's number one. Not only God is not there, you are separated from everyone else. It's the loneliest place in the entire universe. You think you're going there with your friends and enjoy eternity with your friends, think twice. It's the loneliest place in the entire universe for eternity. 
That's what Jesus is trying to tell us. That is why he warns us, get right with God. Now, unless you are sure, then I would not argue with you. But if you're not sure, can I plead with you, can I urge you to look at what Jesus has to say? So never be too careless with this phrase, I don't mind hell, my friends are all there. Never say that. It's a terrible place to be in because we all deserve the wrath of God. Jesus said the only one place you're going without Christ is hell because we all are sinners. We all deserve the wrath of God. And I hope we get that into our mind. We have been preaching this in the book of Romans. What a powerful affirmation of that. If you think you're good, think twice. If you think you can save yourself, think thrice. That's the book of Romans. So we talk about resurrection. You know, in the Bible, people have been raised from the dead, right? Let me tell you the difference between resurrection and resuscitation. You know the word resuscitation? Resuscitation is when we hear of people are drowning, right? You drag them out of the water, they are already not breathing. And what do you do? You pump the water out of their lungs, right? And then you give them, we call it the kiss of life, huh? right? Where you, you blow air, and then after that, they start coughing, and then they come to life again. That's called resuscitation, right? And the same thing happened in a hospital. You know, a person died flatline, we call it flatline, right? And the flatline, you, you take this, this uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, electro something, all right? And you, you, you shock the heart, and then you come to life. That's called resuscitation. It's not called resurrection, all right? That's resuscitation, coming back to life. Now, Lazarus is an example, a good example of resuscitation. Let me explain to you what I mean. Lazarus, remember Lazarus? Good old Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. He was dead four days, already smelly, already busso already, I call it, all right? And Jesus called out Lazarus. Lazarus came out, and he came out, still wrapped around, you know, all right, with all the linen cloth. And, and Jesus said, remove those linen cloths so that he can, you know, move freely. Now, that's called res uh, resuscitation. Why? Because he went back to his own body. Right? It wasn't a new body. That's why I call it resuscitation. In fact, there's a, le there's a story, a legend that says, uh, you know, after Lazarus was resuscitated, he never smiled after that, you know. He never smiled. You know why? He never smiled. Because for four days, he experienced paradise, you know. For four days, he experienced paradise. And then I can imagine, one day I'm going to ask him, huh? I can imagine angels, you know, knock at his door, if there's a door, you know. Hey, it's time for you to go back. Huh? What? I'm not going back. I'm enjoying myself here. No, 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 you have to go back. Jesus calls you. So he went back. And then he went back to the sin-filled world. Because, you know what, he's going to die again. Second time. He's going to die again. And that's why I say, it, I say it's resuscitation. He's going to die. Every person who was raised from the dead will die again. It's not called resurrection. Resurrection, in our definition, is that you're resurrected not into the old body. You're resurrected with a new body. And I spoke about that in the book of Revelation. And so it's important to know the definition of resurrection and resuscitation. Resurrection, let me say again, is receiving a new glorified body that will not grow old. And all the senior people say, oh, you're not too excited. Lah. I'm really excited about this new body. Man. I don't know about you. They will not grow old. They will not die. They will not even have any diseases. You will, not, will never be weak and never be tired because you have gained a new body. And someone asked me, so pastor, do we eat or not with a new body? Obviously, you all love food. Eh? Well, let me say to you, you can eat and eat and eat. You never grow fat, man. Right? Isn't that an amazing life? That I'm going to just excite you about what's to come. Eh? Because if you do not know what's to come, Wow, this life is hard, man. Let me tell you, this life on earth is hard. It's tough. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just to let you know that this is not my word, it's the word of, of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 54 says, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, 
and the mortal with immortality, I'm talking about a new body here, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has swallowed up, will, has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory, O oh, death, where is your sting? And that is why I've conducted so many funerals. People who have died, loved ones who have died. Even my late father died last October, but he's a believer. You know, in all these Christian funerals, we don't say goodbye. We don't say goodbye. What do we say? I'll see you again. Of course, we miss our loved ones. But the joy that I have, for many of my friends who have passed on, church members whom I hardly know sometimes because the church is quite big, but one day I can yum cha with that man or woman for the rest of my life and really get to know them. And so we don't say goodbye, we say see you again. In fact, I was telling last night, the congregation, that one day when I'm at my dying bed, eh, you can ask me to pass my, your regards to your friend. Eh? Because I'm going to see him or her first, you know, the, earlier than you. I'm going to see him. I can pass on your regards to him or her. No, I can talk like that. You know why? Because I know the Word of God. I know what He says. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? So I don't know about you. Eh? Really, think about this more seriously. I look forward to the new body. When we were younger, when we were younger, I'm not so young anymore. When I was younger, I control my body, right? I tell my body, go there, my body goes on and off. I tell my body, do this, my body does it. But now that I'm older, and those of you who are around my age, you understand this, right? You're coming to the stage now. You tell your body, go there, the body will say, ah, maybe. You tell your body to do this, the body is not so sure. And so as we age, we no longer control our body. Our bodies control us. And I was saying last night as well, that nowadays, at this age, I hold my wife's hand a lot. Not because I'm more romantic, I have been holding her hands. I told her I need to hold her hand so that we are both stable. <laughs> we don't want to trip, you know. At this age, we cannot afford to trip anymore. So better hold hands up. Hold hands, okay? Be more romantic. Hold hands more. But here, here I am. I am getting older. It's just part of life. How do we age graciously? How do we age with the hope of God? Because I see so many people having the fear of death. The fear of the unknown, what's ahead. But for us Christians, what an amazing truth of Scripture that we have a life after. So I'm looking forward to this new body. One day you're going to see me, I'm not 64. One day you see me, I'll be 33 years old. At the best of my body, of mind, of spirit and soul, I'll be 33 years old. I can't wait to be 33 again. And you know why I'll be 33? Because if Jesus is 33 when he died and received that body. Because the Bible says you receive a body like Jesus. So I speculate. I must be 33 years old. So don't lose your 33-year-old photo. Eh? Alright? Once in a while you feel depressed about getting older, just look at your 33-year-old photo and say, that's me. That's me. And Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly, eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies. This is a lowly body here. So that they, that means this body, will be like His glorious body. There you go. It's not my words. These are the words of Jesus. That is why His resurrection is so important. If He is not resurrected bodily, I cannot be resurrected bodily. That is why you must affirm that truth. So what, therefore, I think that's the next question you're asking. What is the body of Jesus like? 
Have you ever asked that question? What is this 33? Your old body one day will be like. Of course, the Bible doesn't list out exactly specification of the new body. It doesn't do that. The Bible gives us clues. Clues what it will be like. Do you want to know what this your body, new body will like, be like? Not interested. <laughs> I am deeply interested. Right? So let me tell the story here. You see, when Jesus died, the women, some women, blessed the hearts of the women. They were waiting to, to anoint the body of Jesus because it was Sabbath when Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph. Therefore, they were waiting for Sunday, you know, morning to be able to go and then to anoint the body of Jesus. And when they went to the tomb, because it was rolled, the big stone was rolled over. And when they went over, the stone was rolled away, meaning that the tomb was empty. And there were actually Roman soldiers that were stationed there because the Jewish leaders were so afraid that somebody would come and steal the body of Jesus. And uh, so they stationed, they requested Pilate to, to, to station Roman guards there. And you, if you know Roman guards, they are one of the most disciplined soldiers in the world then. Because to them, they have to keep to the mission, to fulfill the mission. If they don't fulfill the mission, they will be killed. And so they are the most disciplined, you know, trust me, that when I say they will guard, is that nobody will come and steal the body, it will come to pass. Because these are the Roman soldiers. But by the time, all right, the women went there, the tomb was empty. And by the way, by the way, the angels did not roll away the stone so that Jesus can come out or not. It's not the, for that reason. The, the, the angel rolled away the stone so that people can look in and see that the tomb is empty. Because Jesus doesn't need that stone to be rolled away in order for him to be resurrected. So that's a fun fact for all of us. And then once the women peep in and see that the tomb is empty, guess what happened? They were flabbergasted. How can this be? So they dashed back all right, to the disciples and then and told the disciples, and Peter and John, you know the gospel story, right? Peter and John came running to the tomb. And it was, you know, John who, who sort of reached there first, and then he saw and believed that Jesus had risen. Do you know why he believed that Jesus had risen? And nobody has taken the body, why? Because the linen that was wrapped around Jesus went flat. Because if somebody wants to steal the body, it would have to be unwound so-called for somebody to steal it but because it went flat immediately John saw that and he said yes Jesus is definitely something happened to Jesus nobody could have stolen it because otherwise there will be the linen will be unwrapped and so he saw that and then he went back confused maybe what's going on and then when the ladies came on Sunday morning you know what? It's amazing. The first person that Jesus appeared to was a woman. They said, woman, you are so dear to God's heart. That Jesus the heart of Jesus. And so Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene thought that he was a gardener. And so asked the gardener, did you take the body? Remember, there's no way that even a gardener could take the body because the Roman guards were guarding it. There's no way. And then Jesus called out to Mary, Mary. And immediately Mary recognized his voice. What an amazing moment. What an amazing moment for Mary, who was so already so discouraged. The Savior has died. And so the empty tomb is a crucial evidence. And no one, by the way, no one has ever found the body of Jesus. And this is an important truth here. If anyone, if anyone at all can produce the body of Jesus, the whole Christian faith collapses immediately. If anyone can point to the tomb of Jesus where a body is in there and can confirm that is Jesus, the whole Christian faith would collapse immediately. That's how crucial the resurrection body of the resurrected body of Jesus is to our Christian faith. 
So Jesus is alive. Amen? He's fully alive. He's resurrected. Now, sometimes we wonder, no? we wonder to ourselves, uh, wouldn't it be nice that Jesus sort of hung around after that uh, for many, many years to come? Uh? Wouldn't that be nice? Rather than going 40 days later, ascended to heaven, just Jesus in the resurrected body, just hang around here. Wouldn't that make our evangelism so much easier? All right, we go to Amen. And Amen, this is Jesus. Huh? Jesus, this is Amen. And then Jesus goes and shake Amen's hand. And Amen looks in the eye of Jesus, immediately converted already. Because this is God, all right? He can look into your soul. All right. And so sometimes we wish that Jesus is around. Then Jesus can come and visit our service, right? Wow, can you imagine Jesus seated there? It would be amazing service, man. I tell you, all of you will be paying attention. Nobody looking at the handphone, really. Everybody in attention. But you know what? We can't have Jesus here in the resurrected body because we know from Scripture, strangely, that he can only be at one place at one time. So how, how many days and years before you get Jesus to come back to our celebration again? Maybe a long, long time. So Jesus therefore said to us, you know, I can't stay around. I need to go so that I can send someone. Who is that someone? The Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Christ. And that Spirit will be with you all the time at all the places that you will be at. In fact, you know what? He's living in you. Isn't that amazing? I need to go. I need to go so that I can send the Holy Spirit. So he hung around for how long? 40 days. He hung around for 40 days. He was on earth. He demonstrated to the disciples that he was truly alive. Verse 5 of the passage we read, it says there, and then he appeared to Cephas, Peter, that is, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, probably in a huge crowd. He met them. And most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as the one abnormally born. What he means by abnormally born is simply that he didn't live the life of witnessing Jesus like the apostles. He's different. Remember, he was a Pharisee. He was out to even persecute the church. And Jesus appeared to him. Appeared to him. And that is why he said of himself, abnormally born. So in that appearance, remember the story of the road to Emmaus. where two of the relatives who doesn't know Jesus really that well. Okay? But they were discouraged, they were sad. They were walking back to their home in Emmaus, which is about 11 kilometers away from Jerusalem. After the crucifixion, and all after the burial, and on, after Sunday, you know, when they heard about this tomb you know, that was empty, they were walking back to Emmaus, discouraged. They were not sure what's going on. 11 kilometers, walking back to their home. This is somewhere from between here, like PJ, all the way to Sha'alam. So that's about 11 kilometers. That's the kind of walk they'll be doing. And while come, walking back, they were talking about, you know, what happened. And suddenly, remember the story, Jesus appeared and walked beside them. They didn't even know that this was Jesus. And Jesus asked them, what, were you, what are you talking about? And then, you know, Clopas, you know, one of the relatives turned to Jesus and said, don't you know what's going on? This huge thing that's happening in Jerusalem, Jesus died. And uh, so, they, Clopas was actually surprised that Jesus doesn't even know. Of course, Jesus was pretending. And then Jesus gave them a very quick Bible study. He took them through, you know, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. What the Scripture, the, 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 the Old Testament, has to say about the Messiah, how the Messiah needed to suffer first and then enter into glory. So he challenged the, the two relatives. You know, why can't you believe that? And so it must be such an interesting study that Jesus did with them while walking, you know, they ended up at a home rather late in the evening. And so the, they invited, the, these two relatives invited Jesus in the home to stay with them. And then they were breaking meal. They're having a meal together. And while they were having their meal, the Bible says that their eyes were suddenly open. Jesus! 
I always wonder how they know it's Jesus uh, suddenly. Have you ever wondered that? You see, if we know the custom of the Jewish people, that when you eat together, you always pass the bread to the guests first. So that the guests will break it, taking the larger portion or whatever portion that they want for themselves first. That is Jewish culture. So I think this is what happened. When they pass the bread to Jesus, Jesus stretched out his hand, took the bread. And you know what the two relatives saw? The two nail prints on the hand. So when he breaks it, suddenly their eyes will open. Jesus! Can you imagine the excitement that they are feeling? Jesus! In their mind. Is, he, is that really him? Is that Hantu or Tuhan? And so, what didn't help was, the Bible says, he disappeared. They, could, they couldn't even ask him, are you, they, they couldn't even ask him that he, he just disappeared. So you know what? What would you do when that happened? It was evening. They ran all the way back, 11 kilometers, all the way to Jerusalem, and broke into the, I, I think they almost dashed and break into, through their door, like, because they're so excited. You know, you know what happened, right? They ran all the way. He said, we walked with him, and we didn't know that he was in our house, exact words here, to have a meal. He broke bread, and we recognized him. So I you know, speculate that it must be his hands. When he had the bread, they saw the nail prints. But you know the funny part is this. Uh, while they ran all the way, 11 kilometers back to the house, right? Jesus was already there. He was already there ahead of them, you know? Because the next thing you know, after they related this incident, Jesus suddenly appeared. You know? And what's the first word that Jesus said to them? Shalom. Boy, if you were in that room, uh, I think if I'm in that room, I'll freak out. Eh? What an amazing sight. He was already so discouraged. So they were shocked, thinking that he's a hantu, a ghost. So Jesus said, now, look at my hands. Touch my side. So they touch. And they knew that this is not a ghost. In fact, they were still doubting in their minds. They were still doubting. You know what Jesus did? What are you eating? Give me some. So they were eating fish. I almost call it fish and chip. Uh. But they were eating fish. So give me some fish. Broad fish, the Bible says. So he took the broad fish and he ate them. That even further convinced in the mind of the disciples, Hantu, don't eat. And he was eating. Ghosts don't eat. And he was eating in front of them, of them to let them know that I am alive. In fact, later on, there was quite a number of eatings going on. Huh? Later on, remember, he appeared to Peter and the disciples. They had gone back to fishing. He made breakfast for them and eat again. Why? Because he wants to tell them that I am alive. Only a person who's alive will eat. These are not ghosts or spiritual appearances. Now, last night, if you missed that, I want you to listen to that uh, sermon. But in, in a nutshell, I say that there are three phases of human assist, existence. The first phase is the embodied existence, meaning that I have a body. That's why when I speak, you can listen to me. And when you speak, I can listen to you. But when we die, we go to the next phase of existence called disembodied. When we are disembodied, our spirit leaves us. And this body decays. And where does the spirit go? I mentioned there are two places that the spirit will go. If you are one who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, you go straight to paradise, you go straight to heaven. But if you're not who is someone who don't believe in Christ, you go to a waiting place called Hades. It's not hell yet. It's Hades, a waiting place. And I explained to you last night what Hades is. And the place of Hades, you're waiting for that day when judgment, the final judgment will come. When, if your name are not written in the book of life, and Jesus said, you will be sent, consigned, 
to hell. And so Hades is a waiting place. So that's disembodied existence. But Jesus was resurrected. He was given a new body. And that's what we call in that phase the re-embodied existence of our humanity. And Jesus is now re-embodied. He's real. He's alive. Although we notice, as I mentioned earlier on, that he cannot be at one, at many places at one time. Either he was in Jerusalem, he was in Galilee, or he's Emmaus. That's how he existed in fully human form. So as much as he appeared, the many times he disappeared too. Invisible, but present. You know how I know that? Because when he appeared to the disciples, he said, Shalom. Do you know one person was not there? That person is Thomas. Thomas was not there. A week later, when the disciples, his friends, told him, you know, Jesus is alive. What was his response? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Unless I touch the nails, scars, nail prints on his hand, all right? And unless I, I, I touch the side that was pierced, I would not believe the week after. And a week later, when Jesus appeared to him, and say, Thomas, now touch my nail prints hand and my side. How did Jesus know uh, at that point when, when he was doubting? He was invisible. He was present. He was there. That is why we appear among, uh, before Thomas. He could immediately answer his question. Now touch my hands, touch my side. And so, in other words, in the 40 days that Jesus was there, he was mostly invisible, but present. And that is the amazing part, you know, of the body of Christ. That he could do things that he could not do in his old body. For example, if you read the scripture, he walked through doors. He can appear and disappear. He can do many other things, which only one who have a new body can do. That's uh, just clues to us only, you know. We don't know exactly what this new body will do. And so for 40 days, he appeared before many. And uh, then he said, remember he made the promise in the Great Commission, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So remember, Jesus' body can only be at one place at one time. He, he wants to keep this promise in order to do keep this promise, he has to ascend to heaven and then send, all right, the spirit that the Father gave him. He sends the Holy Spirit down to us that he may be with us. Someone just like me, Jesus said. Someone just like me. I'm going to send him down so that he'll be with you, he will help you, he will guide you, he will teach you and be with you. Isn't that an amazing privilege all of us as Christians have? What an amazing privilege. And that is why I've taught you as a church here for many, many few years now, few, many months now, I've asked you to say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Every morning when you wake up, say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Why? To affirm the presence of the Spirit in your life. Don't start the day without the Holy Spirit because Jesus said, I will be with you until the end of the age. So he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That is why he needs to go. He needs to, be, to ascend to heaven. And do you know that one of the things I discovered in Scripture is this, uh, that Jesus never, let me repeat that, he never appeared to his enemies. He never appeared to Pontius Pilate. He never appeared to Annas and Caiaphas with the high priests. He never appeared to the Pharisees. He never appeared to any one of them. He doesn't need to give proof to those who don't have faith in him. Jesus only need to give proof to those who believe and committed to Him. And what more now? We have the presence of the Holy Spirit. And all of us who have been Christians here, I pray, you have experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen? All of us have. What an amazing privilege we have. And that is why when we do the Holy Communion, what are we proclaiming? We are proclaiming Jesus is here. And how is He here? Through the Holy Spirit. Spirit. When you become a Christian, you don't receive Jesus into your heart, by the way. Huh? That's, 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 a, that's wrong in its true sense. Huh? 
Because Jesus, where is Jesus? Seated at the right hand of God. So who are you receiving into your heart? The Spirit of Christ, who comes now and transforms us. And so that is why to Thomas, he said this, after Thomas said, okay, okay, now I believe. So he said in John chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me and you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen, who have not seen and yet have believed. So he's talking about you here. Everyone here, you have not seen Jesus physically, but yet you believe. And that is why he honors you. He honors you by sending the Holy Spirit and asking the Holy Spirit to help you. So he appeared to 500. He appeared to the apostles. And uh, there were... And you no, know, today, we, we don't have eyewitnesses now, right? So how do we know that Jesus is alive? And we can only judge by what we call legal and circumstantial evidences. And through eyewitnesses' account, historical account, and archaeological facts. And that's why as Christians, we can stand tall and say many of these will back up what we believe. It is not empty faith. It is faith backed out by eyewitnesses, and the most powerful eyewitnesses are the four Gospels, plus Apostle Paul, who wrote about Jesus, and many other extra-biblical accounts of Jesus as well. You know, there was this book written by a lawyer called David Limbach, and David Limbaugh wrote a book called Jesus on Trial. And he's a lawyer. A lawyer affirms the truth of the gospel. And in that book, he was, he was writing, you know, to like a legal document. He's a lawyer, a professor also, you know, of law. He wanted to see whether this is truth or not. In fact, if he could dispel it, he would dispel it. But after rigorous you know, study of these legal evidences, circumstantial evidences, he concluded and affirmed the Christian faith. Here's a lawyer. In fact, if you're a lawyer, you'll be very convinced of the evidences given. And here's a law professor who did that. Another man called Frank Morrison. Frank Morrison is a skeptic. He wanted to disprove. He's an investigative journalist. He wanted to disprove Jesus entirely. You know what? He started writing he couldn't get through chapter 1. At the end of chapter 1, he decided he's not going to write it anymore. He changed the entire approach. No longer is he a skeptic. He said, now I believe. He changed the entire book. And that book came out called Who Moved the Stone? And so people have investigated the claims of Jesus. And we stand on solid ground that he is truly alive. But let me ask you, why is it so hard for people to believe in Jesus? Why is it so hard? You know why? Because their minds are made up. Their minds are made up, they are not objective enough to read the Bible for themselves and to investigate for themselves. You know what their fear for many people is? That if Jesus is what he is saying, if he is really God, then it leaves me no choice to change my life. Because if he's really God. So that is why many would not even touch that. Because they want to continue on living the life they want. So that is why I ask you this question. Do you know where you're going when you die? I know. There are many here who knows. And I pray you will know. Let me end by, therefore, asking this question once again. Why is this resurrection relevant to us? And let me give you very quickly, I'm not going to expound on this, but six, six reasons why this resurrection is so important to us. You have heard bits and pieces in, in, my, uh, in my main talk here, but let me summarize with six things. It's amazing truth that I'm really excited about. Number one is this that one day we will all be like Jesus with a glorified body. And everyone say, hallelujah, I'll be 33 years old. It's amazing. What is even amazing is that Jesus 
took his humanity, a glorified body, the humanness of him, he took now that into the Godhead. Isn't that amazing? A human person, glorified human person now, part of the Trinity. Wow, that is an amazing thought. And one day, we will have a body just like him. So that's the first fact. The second fact I mentioned earlier on is that we all have received the Holy Spirit who dwells in us permanently. Isn't that amazing? Jesus went to heaven. He said, I need to go so that I can send the Holy Spirit. So that's fact number two. We all have the Holy Spirit. We are not left to struggle on our own. We are here with the Holy Spirit to help us. And the third thing is this. It's an amazing thing. The third thing is that Jesus is our intercessor. When Jesus went to heaven, He sat next to the Father on the right hand of the Father. What was He doing? What is He doing right now? He's interceding. He's praying. You know what? This is an amazing truth. Even if you are not praying for me, even if no one else is praying for you, Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is saying your name to your heavenly Father. Father, you know John, you know Mary, this is what's going on in this life, you know Julie, you know Amen, you know Akau, you know Mutu. So Jesus is praying for you. What an amazing thought. And fourthly, Jesus is a mediator between sinners, we are all sinners here, and the Holy God. He's someone who represents God to sinners and sinners to God. He's the best person to do it because he's a man. Now, he's a glorified man. He's the ideal mediator. When we sin, you know when we sin, something happened in heaven, eh? you, you need to read the Word of God again. The devil accuses you. There you go, sinning again. There you go, putting that guilt into you. There you go again. Just now, some of you could not have communion just now. You feel so unworthy. There you go, you just fall into the trap again. The, accus the accusation of the evil one. And you know what Jesus is doing? He mediates that. Yes, he's guilty, but sin paid for. He mediates that for you. So that is why we can come into the presence of, of the Lord. He's our advocate, the Bible says. And then fifthly, not only is a mediator, he's our pioneer. He's a pioneer, perfecter of our faith. He's the first human being to be above angels. Isn't that amazing? Now, you may not know this amazing, but to me it's very amazing. Why? Because the order, the hierarchy of beings are actually God, Angels, human beings, then only animals. Now, how do I know that? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 to 7 says this. There's a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you're mindful of him? A son of man, you care for him. You made him a little lower than angels. See, all human beings are lower than angels. But with the resurrected body of Christ, one day, one day, we will be above angels. So the whole order now has changed. He pioneered this for us. Right now, it is God, angels, humans, and animals. With Jesus Christ, the whole thing turned around. Now, it's God, humans, angels, then animals. It's an amazing switchover. Why do I, how do I know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 to 3. It says that, Do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? Church, you need to know that one day you will rule over the world. Number two, do you not know that we, human beings, will judge angels? That means we are above angels one day. Is that an amazing truth? What a privileged position God has given to us. And finally, the sixth most amazing truth is this. Jesus will be our king and ruler. It doesn't stop there. 
Jesus will be king, will be king, our king and ruler, and we will rule with him. That's why all of you are called as with Christ. And one day we will rule with him. Again, how do I know that? Again, from scripture. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8 says, He put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them, the human beings. That was a call in Genesis 1. God restored it now. Yet at present now, we are not, sub we are not subjecting over them yet. But one day the day will come, and then Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, I'm close with this. And God raised us up, human beings. God raised us up with Christ and seated us. I want you to listen to that phrase there. Seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now, this blew my mind. This blew my mind. Right now, right now at this point, if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, you are seated with Him in the heavenly realms. That means we are ruling with Him right now. How are we ruling with Him right now? Now suddenly we realize now the privilege of prayer. We are ruling with Him through our prayers. That is why our prayer matters. What we pray, things happen around us. So we are ruling with Him is a foretaste of what's going to come one day that we will truly now rule over the earth. What a profound mystery, isn't it? What a profound mystery. All these six facts here help me stand tall. Help me stand in confidence of what's ahead of us in the future. There was a child traveling in a train all by himself in a coach. And some of the travelers or passengers in that coach look at the child by, all by himself, very concerned for the child. He went over to the child, they went over to the child and said, you know, are you alone here? Aren't you worried that you're alone? The child looked at these friends who were so concerned about him and said, no, I'm not worried. I'm not worried. Why are you not worried? Because my father is driving this train. And that is why if somebody were to ask you, are you worried that you're alone here? I say, no. Why? Because my father is driving this train. And not only my heavenly father is driving the train, my Lord Jesus Christ is next to him, talking to him about me. And not only that, he sent his Holy Spirit to me. And he lives inside me. And every morning, I can greet him. Good morning, Holy Spirit. And that's what Restoration Sunday is all about. What an amazing, amazing privilege we have as Christians. So salvation is a gift. And some of you here may not be Christians here this morning. Can I encourage you to consider Jesus? Because when you consider Jesus, Jesus shows you what the future is like. And what an amazing... You are not just saved to be forgiven of your sins. Not just that. It's not enough to be just forgiven of our sins. Uh. We are saved for something. We are saved for making a difference in this world. We are saved for the future to come with the new body when we live on the new earth. What the day that will be. And that's why, church, the Easter hope is all about that. Amen? Let's bow our heads right now. Let's bow our heads to be reminded that Christ has died and Christ has is risen and Christ will come again. Holy Spirit, will you come and impress upon us the truth of Scripture? And those of us who are believers, God, help us rejoice in these facts. Rejoice in the fact that Jesus is alive. And some of us here may not be Christians here, Lord. We do not know Jesus. And I pray this morning that, Lord, you will speak to them right now. 
Some of us may have fallen away from our faith, maybe drifted away from our faith. And that's why here on Easter Day. But whatever that is, whether you have, you have not believed in Jesus before, someone invited you here, or maybe you have drifted away from God, you're not sure whether you are saved. I want to challenge you right now. I want to pray with you. I want to ask that Jesus, through His Spirit, will come into your life. So if you desire that, how do you do that? You just made a simple prayer, a, dis- a prayer of decision. You say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I may not know everything about you yet, but I heard what was preached and I understand that I need to know where I'm going. Now, if that's you, I want to pray with you. Maybe you have drifted away from God too. I'm going to pray with you too. And those watching online and those at DMC at Puchong. At the count of three, if that's you, I want you to raise your hands because God sees your hand. And I'm going to pray with you. Remember, it's you and God. You and God, between you and God, you really want to sort out this matter of your future with Him. So at the count of three, if that's you, just raise your hands where you are. God sees that hand. And He will, He will, base, on the basis of your prayer, He will begin that journey with you. Are you ready? At the count of three, while all heads are bowed, no one looking around. Okay, one, two, and three. Is there anyone? Just put up a hand where you are. I want to pray with you. Is there anyone? Just put up your hands where you are. Up in the gallery as well. Anyone? Thank you. Yeah, I see that hand. Thank you very much. I see that hand behind as well. Any other hands? Just raise it up where you are. Right? Just raise it up. Because it's important you raise your hands because God wants you to make a decision. To say, I want to follow you, Jesus. And those watching online, those at DMC at Puchong, up in the gallery. Now, I may not be able to see your hands right now, but I know some hands are up. I can see a few of that. Now, will you pray this prayer together with me? Remember, it's a prayer, a dis- prayer of decision, a prayer to invite G- the Spirit of Jesus to come into you. And this prayer is to say sorry, to say thank you, and to say please. Sorry that you're running your own life, thanking Jesus for dying on the cross, and to say please, please come into my life and the Spirit of Christ will come into your life and make you a new person. So if you would like to do that, you pray with me right now silently in your heart. Just pray this prayer together with me. Those who put up your hand, or you may not have put up your hand, pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, just quietly in your heart, Dear Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my sins, for running my own life, making my own decisions without you. I'm not proud of the things I've done before, And I know, Lord, not only you have hurt those whom I love, but also I hurt you, my God. Please forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me on Good Friday. And I thank you that through the cross that my sins are forgiven. But more importantly that, Jesus, you is alive. You have risen. You have conquered death, Lord. And today, I want to receive your forgiveness and receive that new life in you. Please come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you have said that prayer, will you come up to the front later on? Or tell your friends that I said that prayer. No, we want to help you. You know, in moving on from here, having made that decision to help you grow in Jesus, to discover more and more of this amazing truth of the Scripture. And for the rest of us, I want to open up this time for prayer. This is a time of ministry. And I just sense that for some of us here, we may be going through different things in our life. We may be going through things that put so much fear into us. You know, the story of Easter is about removing that fear from us to know that we are not alone in the way we do things in our life. We have the Holy Spirit, we have Jesus, you know, doing this in our life. So I just sense that some of us have this fear, fear of death. Some of us, simply because we're at a certain age right now, there's so much fear in us, what's going to happen? Some of us may be ill, we are not, you know, not fully healthy, there's so much anxiety. But you know what? God understands. Jesus understands. He went through everything that we have gone through, he died, remember? He has, he has died. He, he faced death. So that's why we can go to Jesus and say, God, help me even in my death. Isn't that an amazing prayer? 
Some of us are fearful of things in life. Like I said, living on this earth is tough. So many decisions we have to make. So many people we have to care for. People who are not well, we are the caregiver. It, that's, that in itself, you think it's a suffering for yourself. The fear of unknown, fear of the future. So many things we are so fearful of. But you know what? Easter is the time where we can go to God and say, God, thank you. I no longer need to fear anymore. So help me, God. Teach me how not to fear. Amen? So whatever your needs are, if you're not well, we want to pray for you. If you have decisions you have to make for future, we want to pray for you. If you have a relative, a friend who's not well, you are so concerned, you have sleepless night over that as well. Pray on behalf, you know, of your friend or relative so that we can, you know, together, you know, cover that person in prayer. Remember, Jesus is praying at the right hand of the Father. He's praying for you right now. So come, receive prayer, all right, from our ministry team here. All right, let's stand. Let's stand and our leaders, pastors will be in front here. And if you need prayer, come quickly. You know, step out from your seat. We want to very quickly pray for you and ask for the Lord's blessing. Don't be shy. You know, we are all in the family of God and we want to just release. If you have made a decision to follow Jesus just now, you know, bring a friend up here. You know, if you have made the decision, we want to help you as well, right? So let's sing this closing song and then whatever your needs are, we want to pray for you. Just come quickly right now to the front. All right, we want to pray for you. Before the world began, you were on his mind, and every tear you cry is precious in his eyes. Because of his great love, he gave his only son, everything was done so you would come. And nothing you can do Could make Him love you more And nothing that you've done Could make Him close the door Because of His great love He gave His only Son Everything was done So you would come Come to the Father Though your gift is small Broken hearts, broken lives He will take them all The power of the Word The power of His blood Everything was done You know how how do you know that you need prayer very simple and i believe there's a presence of the holy spirit here and the holy spirit will prompt us you know if your heart is beating a little bit faster at a certain point of the sermon because he's speaking to you because the holy spirit speaks through his word and if your heart is beating a little bit faster it's what i call sensitizing your heart to the things that are you know troubling you and you may need prayer and I just sent some of us here, you're struggling with certain kind of addiction. You know, you have tried, you have tried, you have tried. And you have almost given up. So I just sent some of us here, we are coming to the place of just giving up. You know, Jesus never gives up on you. In fact, He's praying for you all the time. I also sent some of us here, I just sent in a relationship, is breaking apart. You know, God wants to restore you. God wants to put that resurrection power back into your life. But it has to start with you. I just sense God is saying to you, it has to start with you. And I also sense some of us are making difficult decisions in our life. In fact, you are at a crossroad. You're not sure where to turn. In fact, there are three decisions you have to make. You have to pick one of them. And the Lord is saying to you, you know, trust me on this one. I'm going to give you the wisdom to do that. So I want to sing this one last time here. If whatever needs that you have, we want to pray for you. Remember, if your heart is beating a little bit faster than normal, I think it's a prompting the Holy Spirit upon you right now. Seek prayer. Don't do this alone. Depend on God. All right, so we sing this one last time, and I'm going to close. Come to the Father, though your gift is small. Broken hearts and broken lives, He will take them all. The 
up here you know what the holy spirit is where you are right now so don't look to the front look to yourself and ask the holy spirit to do something for you i believe that there can be an encounter where you're standing those watching online those at dmc at puchong as well you can invite the holy spirit right now and say lord will you touch me in this area everyone has a need here every person so this is what i want you to do whatever your needs are put your hand on that part of you if, it's, if you need physical healing, put your hand on that part of your body because the Spirit knows your need. If it's an issue of your heart, of a mind, it could be a mental, mental you know, uh, stress that you have, put your hand on your head. All right? If you need healing, put that on the part of your body. If you need the Lord to excite you, you know you have been living a life that is just so unexciting in the Lord. Maybe the Lord wants to excite your heart. Just put your hand to your heart. So whatever it is, have the Holy Spirit minister to you right now as I pray this prayer and I'm going to end. But don't leave this place without encountering the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? All right? So do that now. Put your hand to that part of your body and I'm going to pray a prayer of faith that God will do something powerfully in your life. So Holy Spirit, you know every man and woman here, young or old. You know every brother, every sister here. And you may know every, and you know everyone, Lord, who have not give, put their full trust in you yet. But whatever it is, God, you know our needs even before we pray. And so this morning, I pray, Lord, where the hand is placed on that part of the body, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray right now, you will answer, Lord, that prayer, that prayer of desperation of my hearts, right now, God. You answer in the way you see fit. You answer in the way that will bring about a reality of Christ in our lives. So in the name of Jesus, receive every good gift that comes from Him. Because Jesus right now is praying for you. Praying for you, my name. Praying for you, the needs that you have just mentioned in your mind. Right now He's praying, mentioning you by name. So in the name of Jesus, receive that. Receive right now. And walk away from this place. Continue to trust that He will do what He needs to do in all our lives. So receive that right now. Lord, we just seal that into the life of every person here, God. So thank you, Lord. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed Easter.